Thank you for tuning in today. Whether you are tuning in live or you are catching us on demand anytime during the week, maybe you're traveling abroad or you're right there at home, we thank you for being a part of what Gospelite is doing here in Anderson, South Carolina. But one of the things we wanna tell you today is that we desire for this to be a great opportunity for you to tune in if you are unable to be here live. There is no substitute for the local church and for local gatherings as we gather as a community. In that community, we find accountability and growth. We find opportunity to serve and we have a chance to see firsthand what it means to be part of the body of Christ. So we ask you to come one of our services, whether it be on uh, Sunday morning or whether it be one of our gatherings throughout the week in light groups, we ask you to be a part of it. Come grow with us. Church, we need each other. We need community. And we love you. Good morning, Gospel Light fam, and welcome to church. We are so glad you decided to join us for worship this morning. Before we get started, let's jump into some announcements. Equip is a brand new four-week series that begins January 30th, right out of our Ephesians series. This is the theme for 2022, and we can't wait to share the importance of this focus as we open God's Word and look at what the Bible has to say regarding the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. Resolve Prayer and Fasting Challenge began last Monday, but it's not too late to get started. Go to the app or sign up through the website under the Resolve graphic. Sign up today to receive reading plans, a prayer guide, diet plans, and fasting guide. We are also challenging all to participate in a social media blackout during the 21 days of prayer and fasting. This will be a transformational time for anyone looking to start the new year with a refreshed focus and purpose for their lives. There will be a business meeting on January 30th. Members only can vote. Please come prepared having looked at the proposed budget in the 2022 vision packet. February 6th is Friends Sunday. We will be watching the big game and having a meal together the evening of the 6th. Put it on your calendar and start inviting your friends to this special Sunday with a gospel emphasis. This is a great opportunity to shine the light of Jesus in truth and fellowship. On February 11th, we have a special plan for a daddy-daughter date. This day is designed to help build closer relationships between you, your children, and the gospel-like community. There is nothing more important than community for the believer in helping your daughter walk closely with the Lord. On February 12th, we will have a mother-son Nerf battle. Mom, get ready to take up arms and battle your boys to the end of a Nerf bullet. On February 13th, there will be a couple's Valentine's Day banquet served by Gospelite students. Sign up online today to secure your limited spot. See Pastor Nathan for more information. The Anderson Night of Worship is January 23rd. 
Gospel Light students will meet at 6 p.m. and the night of worship will begin at 7 p.m. Anyone is welcome to the student-led night of worship. Savior has done See how His love overcomes He has done great things He has done great things O oh, Hero of Heaven You conquered the grave You free every captive You break every chain
Good morning, Gospel Light. I hope everybody is enjoying a beautiful day at home. I hope we're all looking out of our windows and seeing the beautiful snow, and I hope everybody's feeling well. I know there were quite a few of us that have been sick over the past few weeks. Praise God, I'm feeling so much better, but we do have some sickness in our house. But I pray that everybody is enjoying the good gift of God and being able to be home today. But hey, God has a word for us. And I want you to open your Bibles together with me to James chapter 4. Whether you have a a, a hard copy of the Bible in your hand or you have the Bible on your phone or on an app or on a device, hey, it's it's still God's word. So I'm not going to be picky about which way you read the Bible. But turn with me, if you will, in your Bibles to James chapter 4. Two weeks ago, Chad spoke on the topic of resolve, and I just want to share with you guys, as I've heard from many of you, that that message spoke to me in a powerful way, and I want to follow up today with a sermon, uh, and I just want to warn you that my creative juices were flowing this week, and and I came up with this incredible title, so I want to talk to you today on the topic of resolve. Still resolved. I am still resolved. We're two weeks into 2022, and man, I'm not backing down. I'm not giving up. I'm not slowing down. I want to press on into this new year, and I pray that you guys are too. I am still fired up about my resolution, and this is this is the time of the year that the gyms start going back to their normal number numbers. The The newcomers start dwindling down, and the ones that are truly dedicated stay in there. So so this is the time where we need to step back in and really look at how resolved we are. And for those of you who have taken the the, uh, 21 days of prayer and fasting challenge that Pastor Chad issued to us, I pray that God is speaking to you through uh, each day through the journal. If you were able to pick the book up, you can also download it online if you go to the website. And that was emailed out to everybody that signed up. There's also a study guide. So if you want to follow along with that, I pray that God is using this in your life as he is in mine in a powerful way to draw you closer to Jesus. So every year, every new year, millions of people make resolutions. Some of us keep them Many of us fail to keep them or part of them. Others have simply given up and they mock those who still try to keep their resolutions. And while failed resolutions provide much ammunition for the people who mock resolutions, the Bible is clear about the value of setting goals. So I want to just share a few verses with you up front that that point out the value of setting goals and making resolutions in our lives. Proverbs chapter 21, verse 5 says, The plans of the diligent lead surely to abundance, but everyone who is hasty comes only to poverty. Philippians chapter 3, verse 14, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 3, Commit your way to the Lord and your plans will be established. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 16. In everything, the prudent acts with knowledge, but a fool flaunts his folly. I love Isaiah chapter 32, verse 7. He says, as for the scoundrel, that's a word we don't use a lot anymore. As for the scoundrel, his devices are evil. He plans wicked schemes to ruin the poor with lying words, even when the plea of the needy is right. But, listen to this, he who is noble plans noble things, and on noble things he stands. And if that's not enough for you, Jesus himself points out the value of and and the wisdom of setting goals. In Luke chapter 14, verse 28, he says, For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down, count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? As Chad said a few weeks back, the problem is not with resolutions. The problem is with our ability to keep our resolutions. One of my favorite pastors from history 
is a man named Jonathan Edwards. And I think most of the American population is familiar with Jonathan Edwards for one single sermon that he preached. And it's a sermon that God used in a powerful way. But Jonathan Edwards was one of America's most accomplished intellectuals and theologians. And he is still considered to be a genius by Christians and non-Christians alike. Edwards was used by God to spark New England's first great awakening. And as I've read books and and stories of his life and biographies, uh, I'm just amazed at the life of this man. And I think he's someone that we can learn from. When I was just a young preacher, somebody encouraged me to study biographies of great men and women. And I started doing that probably about 20 years ago. And I have read the lives of many great missionaries, great pastors, great uh, theologians, politicians that God used in a powerful way. And I would encourage you to do that. So Edwards was the only son in a family of 11 children. Think of that, being raised with 10 sisters. I had one sister and we almost killed each other half the time. He had 10 sisters in his house, but I believe it actually made him a better man because he entered Yale on in September in the year 1716 at 12 years of age. 12 years of age. I don't even think I could spell Yale at 12 years of age. And he graduated four years later in 1720 as the valedictorian of his class. He went on to receive his master's degree three years later. As a young man coming out of college, the world and all that it offered lay before this brilliant young man. And he felt pulled between ministry, education, science, and culture. And as he was feeling stressed and overwhelmed about the decisions he had to make that would impact the rest of his life, he, he felt that in this deep season of uncertainty about the future, that he needed to make some resolutions in his life that would carry him through the rest of his life. So he recorded this list. He began recording this list of resolutions in his journal. And at the very beginning of the journal, his brief explanation helped me personally, and I believe it will serve all of us well as we set out to serve God in 2022. These are the words Jonathan Edwards wrote at the beginning of his journal. Being sensible that I am unable to do anything without God's help, I do humbly entreat him by his grace to enable me to keep these resolutions so far as they are agreeable to his will for Christ's sake. So here are a few of the resolutions that this young man, who wasn't even 20 years old yet, these are some of the resolutions that he made. He said, number one, resolved that I will do whatever I think to be most to God's glory and my own good profit and pleasure. Number five, resolved never to lose one moment of time, but improve it the most profitable way I can. Number six, resolved to live with all my might while I do live. Number 16, resolved never to speak evil of anyone. I think we could all camp out there for for a little while. I'm not going to do it this morning. But if the Holy Spirit's speaking to you about that one, that's one that I think a lot of us need to make a resolution this year that we are not going to speak evil of any other man or woman. Number 28, resolve to study the scriptures steadily, constantly, and frequently to grow in the knowledge of the same. Number 56, resolve never to give over nor in the least to slacken my fight with my corruptions or sin, however unsuccessful I may be. Number 67, I love this one. Resolved after affliction, to inquire what I am the better for them, what good I have got by them, and what I might have got by them. I just love the way that Jonathan Edwards writes. I love the way he thinks, and I love the passion of this young man that God was going to use in in such a powerful way in his life. I believe that this resolve was given to him by the Holy Spirit, as he said in his 
brief explanation, he said that I cannot do anything of myself. But through the power of the Holy Spirit, he was able to be a man of great resolve. And like all great men and women, what he did in secret was what enabled him to be used by God in public. I think I might need to say that again. What he did in secret, his character, was what enabled him to live the life that he lived publicly that made such an impact on people and made such an impact for the kingdom of God. So in the book of James, where we're going to be looking today in James chapter 4, the brother of Jesus gives us instructions on how we should live and how we should make resolutions in our lives and how we should not make resolutions in our life. I want to read James chapter 4, verse 13. I want to remind you this morning that this is the very word of God for his people. James chapter 4, 13. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go into such and such town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. I believe there are two types of resolutions that we see in these verses. The first type of resolutions are dangerous resolutions. Dangerous resolutions. Many people make resolutions in their lives that may not even be bad resolutions, but they can be dangerous resolutions based on some factors. I think the first factor is that the dangerous resolution is one that is focused on man. He mentions in this passage that, that he's focused on worldly success. He's focused on serving himself. The basis of his focus is arrogance or boasting. If you have made resolutions this year that are all about you and you're at the center of your universe and everything you do, everything you plan, everything you think comes back to you, I would say that that is a dangerous resolution. Yes, we are called to take care of ourselves. Yes, we are called in our lives to be wise people, but we're not to place the focus on ourselves. And we see this person in James chapter four is, is making plans. He's making resolutions, but he's making some dangerous resolutions because he's focused on himself. It's also a dangerous resolution because he has the wrong motives. He says, let us go to such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Now, I want to remind you that it's not a sin to make a profit. Money is not the root of all evil. The love of money is the root of all evil. But as we see what he says in this passage betrays what he does not say in this passage. He never talks about a love of God. He never talks about making a name for God. He's thinking about making a name for himself. I'm scared that there are many Christians that wake up every morning and the very first thought on their mind is how much money can I make today? How can I make a name for myself? How can I make me famous? How can everybody serve me? And everything is aimed back at yourselves. The majority of self-help books, the majority of motivational speakers, and, and don't get me wrong, I love self-help books. I love motivational speakers. But the problem with most of those is it's so focused on man and it, they totally leave out God, many of them, that they're dangerous in the fact that they make us the center of our own universe and they separate us from the greatest Thing that we need in our lives and the greatest source of power to make good resolutions and to keep those resolutions. The third thing that we see about dangerous resolutions is that they leave out God. 
Nowhere in this man's resolution, nowhere in his plans do we read that he's consulting God's word. We don't see him going to God in prayer and asking what it is that God wants him to do. He doesn't even, we don't even see him asking God's blessings on his plans or for God to give him direction. We don't see him consulting God's word. We don't see him consulting God's will. Matter of fact, God is totally left out of the equation. I wonder how many people who call themselves Christians just want to tack God onto the end of their plans and say, oh, by the way, God, would you bless what it is that I'm trying to do? God, would you get on board with my plans? God, would you bless my will? And in doing that, we're totally going against what the Lord's prayer was all about. Jesus said that we should pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And I want to remind you that God never says it's bad to make plans. Scripture clearly lays out the wisdom of making plans. The problem is that our plans many times focus on ourselves and leave God out. And when our plans come from the wrong motives and they're focused on ourselves, they're dangerous resolutions. The second type of resolution that we see in this passage and in another passage in chapter 5 are what I want to call victorious resolutions. And I want to call our church, I want to call us as a local gathering of believers to focus on this year becoming a year where we make and keep some victorious resolutions. These are the type of resolutions that I want to have and the type of resolutions that make a difference in our lives and in eternity. I want you to read with me in, in James chapter 5, verse 7. He says, Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. We see a picture in James chapter 5, verse 7 and 8 of somebody who is making a resolution that they can actually keep, a resolution that they can be victorious in. And as we look at this farmer that he uses in this passage, we see that this farmer is a man that is focused on God. He is a man that is focused on what the Lord has called him to do. He's waiting for the precious fruits of the earth. He's being patient about it until he receives the gift of God. He's establishing his heart and he's waiting for the coming of the Lord. So, so this farmer is like the man who in chapter four says, if the Lord wills, I will go to such and such a place. If the Lord wills, I will make a profit. If it's the Lord's will for my life, if he will establish these plans, then I will move forward in them. He says that a, a godly man who makes godly resolutions is a man who is patient. He's, he's waiting on the Lord. He's establishing his heart, which means to strengthen yourself. What is it that a godly man strengthens himself in? It's in the promises of God. God is the one that created the laws of nature. God is the one that makes it possible for the rain to come down, for the seed to, to bear a harvest. So the farmer is, is a really good picture for us to focus on a man who makes resolutions and isn't just focused on himself, but he's focused on God because no matter how hard a farmer works, if God doesn't bless his crops, He's not going to have a harvest. God has to send the rain. God has to bless his efforts. The second reason that these, his, his resolution is a victorious resolution is because the farmer stresses preparation. Think about this. The farmer works daylight to dark doing his part, yet he depends upon God to do what only God can do. 
But the farmer doesn't wake up in the morning and say, hey, you know what? I can't make crops grow. I can't make it rain. So I'm just going to sit here, cross my hands and say, hey, God, if, if you want to bless this crop, then I just trust in you. You do it. No, the farmer wakes up early, early, early in the morning and he goes out and he gets busy and he does what he can do. God calls us to work, church. He calls us to live holy lives. He calls us to strive, to press forward, not to earn our salvation, but from the fact that we are saved. And as we press forward into what it is that God calls us to do, we're to prepare the soil. We're to share the good news. We're to love others. We're to walk in holiness and walk in resolve. And we're to prepare doing what we can do so that God can do what only he can do. The third thing that we see about this farmer is that he endures hardship. This word patience speaks of waiting for the goals that God has that we've made that God can only establish as we're waiting, we're going through difficulties. If you've ever done anything with planting or harvesting or any sort of work on a farm, you know that farmers endure setbacks and disappointments. I don't know if anybody else loves the show Little House on the Prairie, but that is one of our favorites in, in my household. My girls, since they were little bitty, have watched that. That's always been one of my wife's favorite shows. It, it ranks right up there with Andy Griffith show in our household. But we love watching Little House on the Prairie. But it's almost a joke. Every episode we turn on, we're like, okay, what's going to happen to Pa in this episode? What well, I mean, the crops burn up one year. There's a drought one year. There's floods. There, there's all sorts of things that happen to him that cause him to not reap the harvest that he's waiting for. Yet, he endures hardship as a faithful servant, as someone who's doing what God is calling him to do. He's enduring hardship. And if, if you want to establish some resolutions in your life that you can be victorious in, I want to remind you, as this passage teaches us, you need to be focused on God. Get the focus off of yourself. We can't do anything without him. You need to stress preparation. Do what God is calling you to do. You have been saved for good works, as Ephesians chapter 2 tells us. And you need to be willing to endure hardships. Many people in the, their Christian life, in their ministry, in their families, they start off well. But so many fail to finish well. I pray that we will be people that start off well and finish well. But if we're going to do that, we will endure hardship. Peter said, don't be surprised when various trials happen. Don't be surprised when you go through persecutions. They are going to come, but we need to endure hardship. We need to be patient. We need to establish our hearts and wait for the coming of the Lord. So in closing, I started out with the story of Jonathan Edwards, and I believe he gives us a great example of a man who lived a resolved life. He married his wife Sarah in 1727, and they were blessed with 11 children. Every night when Mr. Edwards was home, he would spend an hour conversing with his family and playing with his kids, and then he would pray a blessing over his children in an effort to bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord and in the ways of the Lord. Jonathan and his wife, Sarah, passed on a great and a godly legacy to their 11 children, and it reminded me of a verse in Psalms chapter 112, verse 1. He says, Praise the Lord, blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who greatly delights in his commandments, his offspring will be mighty in the land. The generation of the upright will be blessed. That's a promise I want to claim for my children, for my family, for my descendants. I pray that God will make my offspring mighty and that the generation of the upright will be blessed. There's a part that we play in that. We, we need to be upright. We need to fear the Lord. We need to greatly delight in his commandments. 
And then there's this promise that we can claim that his offspring will be mighty in the land and the generation of the upright will be blessed. There was an American educator whose name was A.E. Winship who decided to trace the descendants of Jonathan Edwards almost 150 years after his death. He wanted to see if God answered Jonathan Edwards' prayers to bless his family. And he wanted to see what the result of these resolutions were in this man's life. And his findings were remarkable. They're absolutely staggering when you look at Jonathan Edwards' descendants. Of the almost 1,400 descendants that this man studied, there was an American vice president, three senators, three governors, three mayors, 30 judges, 13 college presidents, 65 college professors, 100 lawyers, 60 physicians, 75 military officers, 100 preachers and missionaries, 60 prominent authors, and 80 other public officials. And that was just in the first 150 years after Jonathan Edwards' death. I pray that every one of us would leave a legacy that glorifies God and that builds his kingdom on earth. As we are making our way in 2022 through this year of resolve, through this year of being equipped in God's word and equipped for the work of the ministry, as we're in the middle of this 21 days of prayer and fasting, let's resolve to grow closer to Jesus, to focus on him, to prepare for what it is he's calling us to do, to endure hardships as faithful servants, and to seek his kingdom first. People who live lives of resolve like this will not regret it. So I pray that you can join in with me and raise your hand and say, I am still resolved. I pray that something in your heart, even if maybe we haven't kept every resolution, I have not perfectly kept every resolution. Being resolved does not mean being perfect. Being resolved means that when you fall down, you get back up and you press on. You follow hard after Jesus. So I want to pray as we close out this service and ask God to fill us with his spirit to empower us to be resolved and to make victorious resolutions and to press forward into what it is that he's calling us to do in 2022. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we love you and God, we thank you so much that you first loved us and it's because of your love that we can love you and that we can love one another. And Holy Spirit, is because of your power that is living inside of each and every child of God, that we are able to be resolved in healthy ways, that we can make resolutions, that we can live those out, not perfectly, but that we can press in and press on and, and follow hard after what it is that you've called us to do in our lives. I pray that our resolutions would come from you, from your word, from your will, and I pray that we would just endure as soldiers and Lord, I pray that we would press on into what it is that you're calling us to do this year. Lord, I believe that time is short. I believe that you are coming soon. And I believe there's no time like today for us to get serious about your will and about your word. And Lord, I pray that you would use this sermon today and this, this text, this passage that was inspired by the Holy Spirit to challenge us to press on into the resolutions that you've given us this year. Lord, I do pray for those of us who are experiencing sicknesses in our homes. I pray that you would bring healing. Lord, I pray that you would keep us uh, in, in your perfect peace. Lord, I pray that you would comfort us in the middle of struggle and suffering. Lord, for those who have lost loved ones, God, I pray that you would be so real to us in the middle of, of, of this season in life. And Lord, I pray that we would just love those well that you've placed around us and that we would draw closer to Jesus. Lord, we thank you for all that you're doing in our lives. Thank you for your word that challenges our hearts. May we press on into this and we ask all this in Jesus' name. All God's people said, 
Amen. so much for worshiping with us today. If you have any questions, would like to submit a prayer request, or tell us of any decisions you made today, please feel free to check out our website and contact us at any time.